Saturday, September 26, 2009. A wet, dreary afternoon in Melbourne. A Herculean battle between the two best teams in the AFL that year. They'd already locked horns in a classic just a few months earlier. It's in his ballpark. The crowd expected another epic battle, and they'd got it. The infamous five-minute warning flashed up on Channel 10's broadcast as scores were level. 131 nervous seconds passed. Gary Ablett Jr. takes possession from a Matthew Scarlett toe poke. You all know what happens next. You also all know that Paul Chapman will be crowned Norm Smith medalist during the post-match presentation. While his opportunistic right foot snap essentially won the match for the Cats with just a couple of minutes remaining, his 26 disposals and game-high 8 inside 50s, not to mention his other two goals from earlier on, meant Chappie was a deserved choice. But there was another player who polled just as many votes as Paul Chapman. In fact, he was the only person on the ground to attract a vote from every single judge. That man? Jason Graham. Graham. The unheralded 25-year-old halfback was reaching the conclusion of what was, statistically, his best season in the league to that point. He was averaging 23 disposals a game, which at St Kilda placed him behind only Lenny Hayes, Nick Del Santo, Lee Montagna and Brendan Goddard in that category. Alongside such company, for Jason Graham to put in a massive performance on the biggest day of the year was perhaps not out of the realm's possibility, but it wasn't exactly predicted. A week earlier in the tense preliminary final win over the Western Bulldogs, Graham would accumulate just seven kicks his lowest for the season. Pair that with six clangers, his highest for the season, and Graham would have had some nervous moments in the days following. While he wasn't about to be dropped for a grand final, the Saints had kept a remarkably consistent lineup all year, he would certainly have hoped for a better dress rehearsal. And yet by the time the final siren had blared on that wet Saturday afternoon, Jason Graham had picked up more possessions than anyone on the field, and in the eyes of many Saints supporters, was best on ground. His basic stat line doesn't immediately tell the story. 19 kicks, 11 handballs, just one tackle, just one clearance. But Graham's role was not to be a wrecking ball, crashing the packs and extracting the footy. He could leave that to Lenny Hayes. Nor was it to apply close contact and wrap up opponents at every opportunity. Save that for Clint Jones. For Jason Graham, all his best work was generated from space. 21 of his 29 possessions were uncontested, and he also took a game high five marks. After half time in particular, the Cats couldn't lay a hand on him. Let's take a look at the breakdown of the Norsemith medal votes from the match. Judges John Worsfold, Nathan Buckley and Jason Dunstall all awarded Paul Chapman three votes. Worsfold, who was the chairman of the panel, I'll get back to that later, was also in agreement with Dunstall on who should receive two votes, our man Jason Graham, while Bucks also picked Graham, but only for one vote. Of the other judges, Jared Healy had Graham on top with three votes, while Jared Waitley had Graham for one vote. We can fill in the blanks with the rest of the vote recipients, but it matters little. Both Chapman and Graham had nine votes apiece, three times as many as the next place getter. But only Chapman would be presented with the award. Why? Because of a process that had been a feature of the professional league's major accolades for more than 70 years, the countback system. To understand why the countback system is in place, we have to go back to the early days of the Brownlow Medal, the league's highest honour awarded to the player deemed best and fairest in a particular season. First instated in 1924, the presentation of the award ran smoothly until 1930, when the league was faced with a dilemma. Three players had tied on the same number of votes. Having not planned for such a situation, no one was really quite sure what to do. Most media outlets suggested Richmond's Stan Judkins should be crowned the winner, as he had played in the fewest amount of games that year of the three leading vote-getters. After some conjecture, that was the path the league took, and Judkins was awarded the medal. But earlier in the week, the league's own permit and umpire committee suggested to the head administrators that no award be presented at all. Such was the unexpected outcome of the voting. Not one scribe had suggested players share the award. It was either one winner or no winners at all. To reduce the chance of a tie happening in the future, the league changed its voting system from one vote per match to the standard 3-2-1 voting system we know today, and installed a countback method by which the player with the most three vote games would win the medal. If players couldn't be separated on three vote games, it would go to the play with the most two vote games, and so on. This seemed a foolproof plan. Yet just 10 years later, to the league's incredulous surprise, the one in a million shot occurred. South Melbourne's Herbie Matthews and Collingwood's Des Fothergill tied for the 1940 Brownlow medal, each with a whopping 32 votes. Their vote tallies were identical. Same threes, same twos, same ones, and they both played in all 18 matches. 
The league was perplexed. At the time, League Rule 13 expressly provided for one player to receive one medal. Why this had to be the case is hard to decipher. Given the Brownlow medal was, and is, still made out of 18 karat gold, there's every chance the cost of making up more than one medal was prohibitive for the league. Then there's the contingency planning of having more than one winner, and the way it would slightly throw out the continuity of the honour roll. There was surely a train of thought at league headquarters that if there could only be one Premier, then there could also only be one Brownlow medalist. So, back to this 1940 decision. It's important in establishing why the league placed so much credence in the countback system. League officials at the time believed that while neither player won the award, neither player lost the award either. This whole, there could only be one winner ideal, seemed to permeate through the minds of the entire administration. At least this time around, unlike a decade earlier, the general public consensus was for the players to each have their own medal, probably due to the exceptional circumstances in which they were deadlocked. The league had to move a motion at a meeting to override its own constitution, requiring a three-fourths majority, just so two Brownlows could be handed out to the worthy winners. Again, debate raged internally. The league's solution, incredibly, was to hold on to the original 1940 Brownlow medal and frame it on the wall at league headquarters, while making up two replica medals for Matthews and Fothergill and presenting one to each player alongside a congratulatory certificate. With the rules being so preventative to not ever allow more than one genuine winner, the countback system embedded itself in the running of the Brownlow medal, and indeed other leagues around the state adopted the same method. The countback tiebreaker was used for the Brownlow in 1949, 1952, 1959, and 1965, with barely a peep from any pundit or player about the possibility of sharing the award instead. So when the concept of the Norsemith medal was first announced in December 1978 for the player a judge best on ground in the grand final of each year, it was obvious that the countback system would be adopted with it. Most interestingly, the league abolished the countback system ahead of the 1981 Brownlow medal as both South's Barry Round and Fitzroy's Bernie Quinlan tied for the award. This started a follow-on effect around the country as small leagues began to also adopt the motto that sharing is caring. And by 1989, the journey was complete as the VFL honoured each player that had lost on countback by awarding them with their own retrospective Brownlow medal and a place in the record books forever. Despite this, no such considerations were ever made for the Norm Smith medal and the countback system remains in place to this day. When Paul Chapman and Jason Graham tied for the highest number of votes on grand final day in 2009, there were probably a great number of people who wouldn't have known what to do next, or what sort of tiebreak method was in place, if at all. Yet Chapman's name lives on in the record books, while Graham's is essentially lost to history. Let's take another look at that graphic from earlier that outlined all the judges' votes. Allow me to deal in some hypotheticals for a moment. Pretend, for a moment, that the votes actually look like this. And that, just as it did in the 1940 Brownlow medal, the two leading vote getters received the same amount of threes, twos, and ones. Remember how I said earlier that John Warsfold was the chairman of the panel? That's not just a fancy title. The chairman has some serious power. In the case of a tie across the board, the chairman gets to cast a deciding vote, ultimately determining who wins the medal. In this hypothetical situation, with Warsfold giving his top marks to Chapman, it would be the clever cat who would win the award. But can you imagine if Warsfold had neither of Chapman or Graham in his votes? Suddenly, he has to make a snap decision on who performed better, despite not considering either player in his best three. History would suggest that one would default to the player on the winning team, and that probably just isn't fair. The league is not averse to correcting its past decisions when the opportunity arises. The 1989 retrospective Brownlows were an early sign of that, and in the years to follow, retrospective Coleman medals and leading goal kicker awards were struck and presented to players who would have achieved the honour had it been around in their era. In 1994, the AFL introduced extra time for tied finals matches, and in 2016, the league rightly, in my opinion, abolished the outdated and cumbersome grand final replay. Slowly and surely, these traditionalist relics of the past are finding their way out of the game. Don't get me wrong, rule changes for the sake of it are not the way to go, but in these cases, where the motivating factor is fairness and equality, it is quite obviously the right decision to make. Only once, in 2011, has there been a mainstream media push for the AFL to ditch the countback method in the Norseth medal and award a retrospective medal to Jason Graham. John Ralph's opinion piece in the Herald Sun just days out from that year's grand final coincided with a move to change Brownlow medal eligibility rules. The article also named Hall of Famer Kevin Bartlett as an advocate for changing what was described as an archaic rule. Brief public discourse took place on online fan forums where responses varied from supporting the rule change in the future but not awarding a retrospective medal to Graham, to debating whether Graham was even worthy of best on ground honours in the first place. Understandably, 
The majority of St Kilda supporters were still hurting from back-to-back -back runner-up placings and appeared unwilling to discuss the merits of such a decision. But the concept of awarding Graham a retrospective medal has never been about the way in which anyone can watch a game from 11 years ago and have a different perspective on who played best. It's about looking at the votes from the day, which, subjective as they may be, will always be set in stone, and recognising that two players received an equal amount of them. And in the same way that two players can win the Brownlow medal, two players should also be able to win the Norm Smith medal. So, what's stopping the AFL from changing the rule, giving Graham his just desserts, and righting the wrongs of history? Firstly, Graham's status within the game at the time may have worked against him. If, hypothetically, a Nick Revolt or Gary Ablett Jr. had lost out on a countback, ridding them of the opportunity to add one of the game's most respected awards to their glittering honour rolls, perhaps league officials would have been forced into action, if not by their own staff, then at least a public push. Secondly, there's more than likely a case of willful ignorance here. Graham's exit from the AFL in 2012 wasn't exactly acrimonious. He was skating on thin ice at St Kilda after multiple warnings from the club towards his behaviour, and was sacked in October of that year following his arrest at Moorabbin Police Station. The 28-year-old was convicted the next month. If the AFL was even remotely considering a retrospective medal for Graham during this time, it would not surprise if his forced exit led league officials to quietly push the suggestion to one side. Recognition and celebration of on-field achievements for players with off-field misdemeanours has been a thorn in the side of the AFL for some time. Finally, the issue is out of sight, out of mind for the league. Certainly in 2020 they have a million more important things to worry about, but even before everything this crazy year has tossed up, no one was ever talking about tied Normsmith medals and abolishing countbacks. Unlike Brownlee Medal Night, where the winner gets a day or two of clear air to have their name up in lights, the achievements of the Norsmith medalist are often lost in the greater achievement of the team, the Premiership. And rightly so. But given there have been no ties in the Norsmith medal voting since that day in 2009, and not even any close calls since Luke Hodges narrowest the victories in 2014, it's meant that the subject simply hasn't been broached by anyone at all. But just because something has always been done one way, it doesn't make it the right way. There is no point waiting around for another tie to happen, particularly if it were to involve superstar players, as one can imagine the AFL inevitably chasing its tail to reward both players before being accused of rules on the run. It's time to make the call now. Abolish the antiquated campback system in the Norsmith medal, allow for joint winners, and award a retrospective medal to Jason Graham, the forgotten man who played his heart out one wet Saturday afternoon in 2009.